Welcome everyone. Um, um, we have with us today um, Dr. Irit Summit from King's College, Dixon Poon School of Law, and um, she um, was formerly a lecturer at Oxford and before that at the uh, University of uh, Essex. Um, she's trained both law and philosophy, and uh, she did a doctorate at uh, Oxford. Her main research uh, interests lie in equity, property law, and theory of private law. And um, it's a great, great pleasure to have you with us today. Um, it's a fascinating paper. Um, the topic is equity, conscience goes to the market. And with that, um, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you very much um, for it. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much for inviting me um, to this really beautiful island uh, with wonderful weather. Um, it's, a great, it's great to come here after the long English winter um, and to meet um, my friends, old and new. Um, I will talk for 30, 40 minutes. I think I apologize to those who read the paper. I guess um, that will be um, a bit of repetitive. Um, so I presume that all of you know something um, about the subject matter, which is equity. Um, I just want to say something personal first. One of, so the reason why I'm so interested, I think, in, in equity is that um, a good scholar of equity um, has to have this wide perspective on the law um, that I think not all subjects of the law require. So if you do equity seriously, you have to do some legal history, you have to do some moral theory, I think, um, you have to, of course, do the doctrine. Equity itself is interlinking with quite a few areas of private law and public law, so you are supposed to be sort of a Renaissance man or woman in order to be um, a good scholar of equity. And this is challenging for us, but I think it's, it's enriching and it's rewarding at the end of the day. So here, so my perspective here is um, not historical, though I will say something about the history, but it is um, philosophical, it comes from um, moral theory, and I think that the interlinks between moral theory and equity are particularly um, rewarding and interesting um, to engage in. Um, so I will do a little bit of legal history first, um, just to um, remind you where equity is starting. So about the, the early medieval roots are a bit murky, but 13th, 14th century in England, equity begins as a sort of um, appeal court on common law. And ever since then, it sees itself as a gloss on the common law, as a way of correcting deficiencies within common law. So this ethos that started really, really early on is still with us. And this is, I think, um, the infrastructure for my paper, that equity is there to correct some failures, inherent failures in the common law. Um, and if it cannot do that, or if these failures are not there, then equity um, cannot justify its independent existence side by side with <coughs> the common law. Um, so as we said, it started as a sort of appeal court on common law, but eventually it became an independent court of chancery where equity was um, applied. And if you had a, a, a good lawyer, they could, he or she could tell you, it was actually only he, he could tell you um, whether given your claim you want to go to equity, or given your grievance you want to make a claim in equity, or you want to make a claim in common law, and you would go and you would choose one of the courses, either go to equity or to common law. So the two um, jurisdictions developed side by side, sometimes they were influenced by each other, mostly they were fighting and, they were, and there was a competition between them, until in the 19th century they were unified from an institutional point of view. Okay, so the same court is applying both equity and common law. And since then, so middle of the 19th century, end of the 19th century, the, there is a debate about the question whether this institutional unification of equity and common law should also lead, or also does lead, in fact, to 
um, a unification in terms of the substantive law. Um, and my argument basically in this paper is that the answer is no, although the two jurisdictions are administered by the same court, we should preserve equity as an independent way of doing things, as an independent um, collections of doctrines that have their own ethos, they have their own um, way of uh, reason about facts and thinking about the parties and thinking about the parties' right, their own jargon. Um, basically, the concept of con conscience is running through them um, and that we should keep it that way. Um, so I need to um, support this argument and this is what I'm doing in this um, paper. Okay, so there are, I'll start uh, with the handout. So this is my question. So the question whether equity should be preserved as an independent body of law um, receives, I call it, three and a half answers. The first answer is, I would call it the Australian answer. The Australian answer is no, equity should be kept independent because there's no authority to the court to take the unification with common law um, into substantial matters. Okay? So that's a striking no. It, they, they call it the fusion fallacy. Right? You cannot fuse common law and equity in any, any way. Um, the, exact opposite answer you would call the American. The Americans are, most of the Americans are avid supporters of fusion, so much so that the, if you ask American lawyers, even I'm not talking about young people, I'm talking about people in, even in their 60s, so I hear they never taught a course in equity. They don't know exactly what equity is. If you ask them, they will say something about remedies. I think um, you wrote about, I wrote about this in my papers. They will know that as of late, the Supreme Court introduced, reintroduced a distinction between equity and common law only in this little area of remedies and in some areas of public law. But all in all, in private law, they see themselves as in a post-fusion era. Okay? So they've already gone beyond even the argument so that's the um, American way. Um, the two and a half is, I call it the English school of fusion. So the English school of fusion is like the American in the sense that they say that the two need to be unified, but they are not like the Americans in the sense that, first of all, doctrinally speaking, the um, equity and common law are still separate. Um, and also I think that they are more willing to accept that there are areas like trust law, for example, that can be exempted from the fusion project. Um, I'll leave it with that. Um, and then there's the third answer, which is, I think is the right answer. Um, and the answer is uh, that no, that most, at least most doctrines of equity should be left alone. Okay? But um, it is different from the Australian a, in the sense that I think that equity and common law should learn from each other, and where there are differences between them that cannot be justified within um, a scheme like my scheme, then these differences should be abolished, which is something the Australian won't get, because for the Australian, the fact that this is the way things have been done is enough by way of reason to explain why equity and common law are different. And I think this is... This is way too rigid. You need to explain for each difference and to justify it within um, uh, a scheme um, of anti-fusion project. It's um, also different from the Australian in the sense that I think that so for some doctrines, really the difference today don't, the difference, the difference today do not reflect anything but historical tradition. And if this is so, for any doctrine where this is so, um, it needs to be fused with um, the uh, common law parallel. Okay, so um, up until now I've been talking about what you call, what I call the fusion project, the fusion between common law and equity. Um, so obviously if we embark on this kind of a project, 
what is unique to equity will be gone. But for the fusion um, school, it is not necessarily so that if we say there's a problem that equity and common law are giving different solutions to, it doesn't mean that we are going to pick the common law solutions. It may sometimes we're going to pick the equity, sometimes the common law. The idea is that we want one solution, but the fusionists don't come around and say the common law necessarily is a better solution. Okay, so in sort of if if you would write a, a unified code, sometimes you recognise the solution that comes from equity, sometimes you recognise the solution that originated in the common law courts. But there is a, a, another older critique of equity, um, which I call the Chancellor Foot critique, um, that is in a way much more devastating to equity, because they find equity to be faulty, that there's something wrong with the way equity is doing law to begin with. So it needs to be abolished or, or, or at least um, weakened um, whenever it, there is a contrast between what equity is telling us to do and what common law is telling us to do. So common law should, in principle, defeat equity okay, whenever there seems to be um, a tension between them. Um, so, so, it's, so these are two critiques here, the, the fusion critique that says that equity needs to be fused with common law, and there is uh, uh, the, the Chancellor of Foot critique that tells us that equity should be set, mostly set aside, or at least whatever is special to equity, the way it is different from common law, should be um, set aside. Now, um, the, I think that the main target of the um, Chancellor Foot critique is the category of conscience which runs along all the doctrines of equity, at least those that I know. They are deeply dissatisfied with this category of conscience. Um, and I have taken this attack on the conscience to, um, uh, to um, symbolize or to be the, uh, the, sort of the concentration of their um, critique. So I thought that in order to bring out uh, nicely these two critiques, it would be good to put them in terms of the rule of law um, concept. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the rule of law now um, and then we'll apply um, the concept of rule of law to these two um, critiques of equity. So the concept of rule of law that I, I employ here is um, it's formalist and minimalist. It's basically Joseph Raz's um, concept of rule of law. Um, in what way is it formalist? So Joseph is taking, so Raz is taking um, uh, Fuller's eight criteria um, for a successful uh, legal norm, and he says if a legal norm abides by these formal criteria, no matter its content, then it is successful from the point of view of the rule of law. Okay? And so it will be, it needs to be clear, it needs to be um, uh, promulgated ahead of the act which it regulates, um, it needs to be, uh, it shouldn't be contradictory, so you know, the, all the, um, the famous eight uh, desiderata of um, Fuller. So it's formalist in the sense that we look only at the form and not at the content of the norm in order to decide whether um, it's successful, it successfully um, uh, implement the rule of law. Now this m formalist con concept um, is of course not the only one. Um, there are the two other main contenders to explaining the rule of law are the fully fledged substantial um, concept that says that every norm that is um, con that whose conduct contradicts the uh, democratic values, um, the participatory democracy, liberalism, whatever nice values that you know has to be instantiated in a legal norm in order for it to abide by the rule of law um, ideal. Um, now this, this is all very nice, but at the end of the day it becomes so fuzzy that it is actually telling us that good norms are norms uh, that sorry that in order for a norm to 
a rule of law ideal, it needs to be a good law. Which it, it's hard to work with it analytically. It doesn't explain a lot about the norm beyond um, general political theory about what is the good law. Um, and I think that, that Raz Fuller concept is giving us an analytical tool to explain what is it in the law that makes it uh, possible for, for, for bad rulers to exploit the law in order to wield arbitrary power. Okay? So what they're telling you, and I think it's, 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 it's very, very useful for projects like mine, is that the law, as Joseph says, is like a knife. It can be used for good things, it can be used for bad things. One of the bad things that you can, it can be used for many bad things, one of the bad things it can be used to, and that it's very, very dangerous and we need to be conscious of it, is for expression or wielding uh, exercise of arbitrary state power. And what the rule of law is telling us is what legal norms will not or cannot be used for this purpose. Okay? So this is the formalist conception. It is also what I call um, minimalist in the sense that, according to Joseph, and here he parts ways with Fuller, um, it is not so that morally bad norms will necessarily not do very well on the criteria for the rule of law. You can have, if you say that all um, albino children can be taken from their homes in order to be sacrificed, say in Tanzania, this is of course morally abhorrent, but the norm itself abides by the idea of moral law, right? It's clear, it's predictable, it's general, it's promulgated um, ahead of the act. Okay? All the lovely criteria of the rule of law applies to it, and it's morally abhorrent. Okay? Um, and that again focuses our attention on what is it that we want from a norm that abides by the rule of law ideal. We want it to guide behavior. We wanted to be able to give us some guidance on what do we need to do in order to be okay with the law. Okay? Because if a law is not clear and it's not predictable and it's not general, then we don't know how we need to conduct ourselves if we don't want the law to come around afterwards and say, hey, that was wrong of you to do. Now you'll have to pay for it. Now you'll have to pay taxes. Now you're going to go to jail or whatever, whatever the consequences are. So there is a, a special, well, there is a unique way in which the state can intervene and interfere in our life through the law. And if the special, in, in specific legal norm it abides by the idea of the rule of law, then the state cannot do that to us. It can do many things to us. It can take my albino child that I love, but it will not interfere in my plans for the future because I couldn't guide myself on what the law is, what are the ramif legal ramifications of my actions um, is likely to be. Okay. Um, now let's see, now that we have this scheme, let's see in what way um, the fusion and the um, Chancellor Foot critique. Um, are actually saying that the typical norm of equity does not abide by the requirements of the rule of law. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what equity is doing. So if you think about estoppel, if you think about constructive trust, I think that would be the easiest um, examples perhaps for me. What equity is doing is saying that a very cr clear rule of um, common law, i.e., you don't transfer rights in land if there is no writing. Very clear. Like, it, it couldn't be better from the point of view of rule of law. No writing, no transfer of property rights. Equity comes in and muddles all this in a, in a, in a way that, according to the critics, um, is uh, uh, taking the norm that was perfectly rule of law um, abiding and making it into a, to a model um, that cannot guide um, the behavior of the citizens, 
that give judges the opportunity to wield arbitrary power, everything we want to avoid. Because if you take um, a stop for example, what it's telling you is that sometimes, and I can't tell you exactly when, right, but sometimes if I make an oral promise to you, or if I make some oral commitment to you with no writing to transfer some property rights to you, then the law will come and enforce it on me. And there's no way, even if you read Ben McFarlane's 900 pages, James, how much? There's no way you can tell ahead at which cases the law will come and say, actually, here, the rule about writing is not working. Okay? So, according to the fusion school, what is missing, the criteria I think that is missing, the, law, the rule of law criteria that is missing, is the criteria of generality. The criteria of generality is telling us that the reasons why we apply a certain norms have to be similar to the reasons why we enacted the norm to begin with. But according to the fusion school, the reasons why we let equity diverse, diverge from the common law is purely historical. We're saying, well, you know, this is our legal tradition. This is history, this is why we do it, this is the way it has been done in history, historically, and therefore we are, in this case, we're not going to enforce the rule about no writing, no transfer. In other cases, we are going to enforce this is because this is what history is telling us to do. If this is true, they say, then there's a complete mismatch between the real reason why the, the norm about writing has been uh, uh, enacted in the first place, it's funny to say enacted here, has been thought about or has been, because it's common law, okay, <laughs> um, why it's there on the table and the reason why we suddenly muddle it, okay. Um, the problem from the point of view, the problem with equity from the point of view of the Chancellor Foot critique is that the norms of equity are not predictable and they are not clear. So, of course, it's the two are linked, uh, closely linked um, together. If a norm is not clear, then of course we, we cannot predict um, how, how it's going to be um, implemented. Um, so what I try to show in the, uh, in the paper, and I'm not going to go into it um, in details now, is that when you first read Fuller's list, it's, well, of course all norms have to be um, proscriptive, right? And of course all norms have to be clear and predictable. Of course we want that. It's very intuitive. But when you dig in a little bit, you see that actually that it's, it's, it's not that clear, right? Um, even, even about clarity that you think, of course we want all the norms to be clear. Well, how can it be otherwise? So I refer you to uh, quite extensive literature on tax law, for example, and they say, well, no, you have to look at the purpose behind the, um, behind the, uh, uh, the law, here the law of tax, and actually, when you look at the purpose, and the purpose of the law of trust is, of course, to generate income to the state. In order to generate income to the state, actually, it's better to compromise clarity um, in various ways, as they actually do in tax law. It's a big, big problem. The tax law in all developed countries, most developed countries, is not clear. People cannot read the tax code and know from the tax code what they need to do. And so some see it as a problem, but many taxes say no, it's not. It's not a problem. It's it's a good. So um, and the same would go for for pr prospectivity um, and ad hocness and um, etc. Okay. So we need to take these um, uh, criteria for the rule of law with um, a pinch of salt. Okay. Nevertheless. I think the people like me who think that equity needs to be preserved have a case to answer. They need to explain why they have to show that for the case of equity, really we should compromise the clarity the way the tax people, the tax scholars show that we should do that in tax. We should um, uh, compromise clarity, we should compromise predictability, and we should compromise generality. Okay? Because the, the, the baseline, the, um, the intuition that um, the fullest desiderata for the rule of law should apply to every norm is a very strong one. And it's, uh, the burden is on me to show, or on us, the people that, that, that 
think equity should be independent, the uh, burden is on us to show that equity is indeed one of those cases where we're willing to compromise the, the desiderata. Okay, so I'm on the second page of the handout. Um, and I'm getting to the more positive uh, part of my paper. And I want to say that equity has a job to do. It is doing something important for us. It is doing something important for the law, and therefore, and, and not only that, and that the way it is in tension with the rule of law is absolutely necessary for it to do its job well. So if we think that the job is important, and if I persuade you that it, equity needs to be the way it is in order to perform the job, then we say, okay, it, there's a tension between equity and the rule of law, but it's a frog that we are willing to swallow. Okay? So the job is, um, I call it to promote the accountability correspondence. So accountability correspondence, um, I define it that when legal rules impose liability, it should ideally correspond to the pattern of moral duty in the circumstances to which the rule applies. So if we assume that the law should serve morality, one important way in which the law indeed serves morality is by implementing this ideal of accountability correspondence. So I'm not saying here, of course, that the law should enforce all morality. What I'm saying here, what I'm trying to say here, is that when the law does regulate a a certain behavior, it does decide, um, say, a dispute where morality has something to say about this dispute, ideally the law should follow morality, or at least it shouldn't contradict morality in the way it solves this dispute. So there should ideally be correspondence right, between um, the legal liability and moral responsibility or your legal liability and to your, um, to your fellow citizen and your moral duty to these fellow citizens. And if they fall apart, moral responsibility and legal liability, that will have dangerous ramification for the system and for the justice that is done between the parties. Okay? So in a way, if you want, I think I'm trying to shift the burden here up to the people um, who think that, in com that even when the common law solution is contradictory to what we would think moral law would say, um, we need to go on with the common law. Okay? We need to take the common law and leave equity aside. And I want to say that this is what equity is doing. Equity is, equity's job is to get to push the law towards the ideal of accountability correspondence. So the first thing that we need to accept is that the rule of law is not the only ideal for a legal norm. So when you look at Hayek and when you look at other more right-wing writers, ne neoliberals writers, you see that when they write about the rule of law, it looks like the rule of law is the last, the first and the last word about the successful legal norm. Okay? If a legal norm does not abide by the rule of law, there's something wrong with it. Period. Um, but as Fuller himself writes, and Raz and many other liberal, but not libertarian writers tell us, this is not so. The rule of law is very important, but it is only one idea. And I'm saying that what happens in cases when equity intervenes is that the, the common law gets so obsessed with the rule of law that it forgets, so to speak, about the other idea, about other ideas. One of them is accountability correspondence. And, it, and it's a failure when it does that because the rule of law is not the only idea. It should be balanced against other ideas. And what equity is doing is tapping on its shoulder and saying, excuse me, you forgot something. And this is the accountability correspondence and it's steering the law back into a more balanced um, 
way of uh, legal reasoning. Um, so the danger that to the whole system from a rift between um, legal responsibility, sorry, legal liability and moral responsibility um, is, I, th I think it comes up very, very cl quick, clearly when you look at empirical research into the quite a few cases when there is a perception by the people that the law does not follow the moral, that the law of the courts does not follow the moral law. And it shows that, um, so most of this research is done on criminal law. Okay, what happens when people, uh, when, when there's a difference between what people think should be punished, what the, uh, how, how uh, severe the punishment should be, and when the criminal law is either lagging behind or if it's trying to lead the way and the people are not there yet. But anyway, when there is, when there is a, a, a diverge, when, when the uh, law does not follow common perceptions, um, then the trust of the people in the system as a whole is starting to crumble. It's not only that they think, oh, in this specific criminal law here, here there's a problem. No, they think that if there's a problem here, and then maybe there's another, and then they think, well, and this tax is unjust, and this criminal offence shouldn't be a criminal offence, or this act that is a criminal offence that isn't, should be, or should be punished more, then they the trust in the whole system is starting to crumble. They start cheating on the, on, on, on the taxmen, they start um, cheating on the state in different ways, littering even. So you see that it, there's an erosion of the civic society. So the um, correspondence really between legal liability and moral responsibility is extremely important to the system as a whole. So beyond the the fact that between the two parties, if the law does not follow morality, there's a good, good chance at least that, um, there's, that, that the result is unjust. Okay? Um, there's a, 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 a sort of policy uh, consideration why we should avoid this um, kind of uh, cases. Um, okay, so if you agree with me <laughs> that we should uh, uh, try to implement the idea of um, accountability, uh, the ideal of accountability correspondence, um, then I now want to show or argue that equity, in, this is indeed what equity um, is doing. And I think that for, for equity really to be able to do that, um, it needs, we need to um, accord the concept of conscience um, real content. We shouldn't say, like quite a few people say, well, the category of conscience, it's just a, it's, it's just a rhetorical device when they talk about unconscionability. This, this is not what is making, doing the work. What is doing the work are the doctrines of equity and the rules as we see them. And once the, the doctrine has decided that either the claimant or the defendant is right, then the judge will say, and it's also unconscientiable, or it's not unconscientiable. It doesn't give the courts, in other words, real power, real power to, or, or real discretion to think about conscience and about, when, when I talk about conscience, I talk about the moral duty of the defendant. Um, and I think that the reason why uh, the, the people that um, adhere to the uh, Chancellor Foot critique why they're so worried about the concept of conscience is because they employ the wrong concept of conscience. They're thinking about conscience in the wrong way. They're thinking about conscience actually the way public lawyers think about conscience. So if you think about um, the way public lawyers talk about your right to conscientiously act against your state or refuse to go to the army, or they, for them, conscience has nothing to do with the truth. Conscience is your inner voice, is your integrity, is what is this voice from within that is telling you what to do. So even if everybody agree that now going out to Iraq and fighting the ISIS is the right thing to do because they're slaughtering um, 
uh, uh, religious minority, women and children, and this is a, a, the humanistic uh, duty of you to go out and find them. If you are a Quaker and you think you should never ever fight, we're going to respect this, even we say, you're wrong, but because your conscience, your integrity is at stake, we're going to let you off. Okay? This is how public lawyers use the word conscience. But actually, this is only one way of looking at conscience. And I think that what equity is doing is employing a different, completely different model of conscience. Um, and this is um, an objectivist model of conscience. So one objectivist model of conscience, which I think is very successful, is um, the Kantian model of conscience. And what Kant is doing when he's talking about conscience is trying to reconcile the fact that with conscience, on the one hand, we feel that there's an inner voice. That's the idea of the conscience. Somebody's talking to us from in our head and say, don't do that, or you have to do that. That's, that's the phenomenon, right? This is, this is what we're talking about when we talk about conscience. On the other hand, he's telling us the voice, yeah? The voice is telling us what is the right thing to do. So there's something ob deeply objective there. It tells us your moral duty is to do that. So how do you reconcile the objectivist and sort of very deeply subjectivist elements of conscience. And for Kant, um, this subjectivist, so I think the analogy, so let's say the analogy for Kant would be of solving a mathematical problem. Let's say you work really hard to solve a problem in mathematics. So on the one hand, you feel that the solution has come from within you, right? It bubbles up. You've thought about it for many, for many, many hours. Maybe you you kind of spend the night over it. It bums up. On the other hand, it's obvious to you that what you found is something completely universal and objective. So there is a, um, a sort of overlap here between the objective and the subjective that is for Kant is extremely important. And he says that the uh, psychological mechanism of the conscience is the sort of the way in which um, the, our moral being is a motive. It can lead us to action. Um, because if, you know, the kind of way everything comes from the head, it needs to fight inclination. It needs to fight, to, to fight something very, very deep that has, very, that has a, a very strong power to push us to action. Something, there has to be a counterbalance. If we are to do the right thing, something has to counterbalance the, inc the inclination. And the counterbalancing of the inclination comes from the conscience. So it's an inner um, uh, voice that reflects our humanity, that reflects our way of looking at things in a moral way. Okay? So the fact that it comes from within doesn't mean that it's subjective. It's objective through and through, but it's subjective in the sense that it's leading you to act okay, as a person. And this, I think, is the concept that equity is using when it's using when it's talking about conscience. It is looking at a defendant and telling the defendant that his or, or her conscience okay, should have led her to act in a certain way. So it's her conscience. So if the inner voice didn't say anything to it, and that's that's again something that um, Kant is talking about, um, and if the defendant's conscience never told him to do anything, never told him, look, what you're doing here is wrong, then it is the defendant's fault. Why? Because they didn't keep the conscience in good working condition. Okay? Probably, so according to Kant, we can know the answer to every moral question if we think about it hard enough. So you don't have to be that optimistic, but I think we can agree, or I would agree, that we do have that most or, or dilemmas or many many of the dile moral dilemmas that we come across um, we if we're frank if we think about it if we don't rationalize if we don't deceive ourselves we know what the right answer is but we need to be willing to think through and think about things that are not comfortable for us and this is hard work you need to work on yourself in order to be open to the right answer in morality. And so 
if the defendant come around and say, well, I couldn't even think about it, this is not my conscience, you tell them, yes, it is your conscience, only it's buried or muted by you, because you didn't want to listen, because you didn't, and if you deceive yourself on a regular basis, and you're rational on a regular basis, eventually the conscience is not going to work very well, and you really are not going to hear the answer anymore, and I think when you read um, Macbeth, or when you read other good plays, you see it. At the beginning they feel very guilty, and when you read other psychological reports, the first killing is always the hardest, because the conscience works very hard. And the more you do it, the more you do it, it's, that's it. The conscience is not working anymore. It's muted. It's silent. Okay? But it's up to you to get to this stage. It's your responsibility if you got to this stage where your conscience is quiet. So when equity is using the language of conscience, it is doing something very important because it is um, reminding people that <coughs> conscience is not only among friends or among family, it's also when you go to market. In market relationship, you should also keep your conscience active mm -hmm. and in a very good working condition. Listen to your conscience because it can give you um, a very good guidance on what you need to do. So not only the profit, not only the, um, the last line, okay, um, but also your conscience. Um, so the um, the, the use of the jargon, the moral jargon that we see in equity, also has a very important communicative work to do, which is to tell people that conscience is active in the market as well, not only in the house or, or in other private um, settings. Um, I will just say something now about the um, last uh, section. So I started with the critics of equity, I said that actually we can understand the critics in terms of the rule of law as an argument that equity is in tension with the rule of law or puts the rule of law in risk. Um, and I then say, okay, maybe it compromises the rule of law, but it implements a different ideal uh, that needs to be balanced against the rule of law. Um, but I now want to say that actually, if you sort of dig deeper, you see that actually equity is not in as much ten tension with the rule of law as the critics want to say. Um, and there are a few reasons why, why I think so. So I mentioned two here. Um, one is that if you look at um, conscience as an objective um, concept, then the argument of the uh, Chancellor Foot critics that using conscience is giving license to judges to decide on their private moral views, to decide cases on private moral views, which is of course unpredictable and lead to like cases being treated in a different way because different judges have different moral views. But if you employ an objectivist concept of conscience, um, then actually this worry is not as great because in principle at least different judges will reach the same conclusion right so there's a, there's a heavy duty assumption here of course that there is such thing as a, an objective um uh, objective moral view but if you're with me on that and and you say that equity is actually sending you in this direction of the objective moral view then in principles different judges should apply the same moral law, just as different judges apply the same legal law, so to speak. Of course, there is more chance of mistake, okay? I think, depends on what, what law, so some laws are, are quite murky as well. So it's more difficult because it's not written and so on, but all in all, um, unless it is in a very gray area, different judges should arrive into the same conclusion about the application of morality to the case. Um, and I also say that if it is really gray area, then equity shouldn't intervene. If the judges then say, well, I'm really not sure what is the moral duty of the defendant in this case, then they shouldn't let equity intervene and they should leave legal liability as it stands. Okay? And if they take this position, then Again, the chances that different judges will decide differently just because they have different moral views is further reduced. Um, 
another reason why, um, and this is not my reason, it's, uh, I take it from Dennis Klimchuk and from other uh, uh, writers on the subject of the rule of law. Um, so we talked beforehand about uh, the, formal, the formalistic perception of the rule of law and why it's minimalistic. Um, but there is a, a now emerging a completely different um, perception of the rule of law that says what is common to the formalist and the substantive and the have substancing and, and, and the kind of natural law, what is common to them is that they think that the rule of law, the purpose of the rule of law is to protect the citizens from arbitrary state power. But they say, no, actually, the rule of law should do more than that. It should protect you from any arbitrary power, even from a non-state um, bodies, from private citizens. And if you take this view, then equity, what equity is doing is protecting one citizen from the arbitrary power of another citizen, right? So if you and I are negotiating for me to buy um, a land from you, and the law says then unless I have writing from you, then nothing that has been said between us will not be enough to transfer your right to me, even if you made promises to me and you told me and I relied on you and everything. That's what common law says. If, if you didn't write it for me, okay, then it's not enough for me. Okay? Then and you are using that in order to extract advantages for me. For example, let's say you encourage me. I'm sorry, you're an ask guy. Let's say you encourage me orally. Go ahead and you can make pre-contractual investment and you'll do this and you do that and it's fine and we're going to sign next month and don't worry, my lawyer is working about that, it's going to be okay. And I go ahead and I make substantive um, investment on the basis of your promise. The next day, you can come around again, my apologies, and say, I'm sorry, no contract unless you pay me more. And you will know how much I invested, of course, and you can blackmail me. Because unless I have the contract, all my investment is going to ground, right? It's going to be a race. The law that says that with no, write, no writing, no transfer of right, never meant to give you this power over me, obviously. The intentions of, of, of the, the, the people who thought about the, the idea of formality Never, we're never there, right? It, it's for honest people. So in a way, what equity is doing is curbing your possibility of exercising, exercising private um, arbitrary power over me. And in that way, equity is also implementing the rule of law, albeit in a different way from the private rather than um, the public uh, perspective. I'll stop here.